text from the book of Genesis. We'll be reading from chapter 32, beginning at verse 22. A familiar story to many and maybe a new one to some. Where we talk about the patriarch, Jacob. That night, the writer says, he got up took his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, and crossed the ford at Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? We thank you, O Lord, for this morning so bright and beautiful and full of your divine possibilities. We ask that your Holy Spirit now come and fill this place to teach and touch and to transform. So speak through me and speak despite me because we're all yearning to hear a word from the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and the people of God all said, Amen. Welcome to this, our inaugural 832 alternative worship experience. You all are the first. You all get to take home the trophy and the t-shirt. Hallelujah. It's been a long time coming uh, for many, Uh, It was too soon coming for some. Somebody say amen. Uh, And so it is that it is a change. Uh, A change to some, a change for many of us. Change, as you know, can be a four-letter word. I'm going to let you chew on that for a minute. C-H-A, four-letter word. Uh, for some change is defined uh, by Merriam-Webster as becoming or making different. Something is different. But change doesn't come easily to many of us. Change makes some of us feel a little off kilter, a little uncomfortable, out of kilter, out of space. Out, and we, 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 sometimes, we just don't like it. Right. Hallelujah. Uh, and and uh, uh, many have spoken to us about change. There is no constant, my friends, in our world today except change. Uh, uh, Richard Svensson, uh, a psychiatrist and doctor, uh, has suggested to us in his book called Margin that the dizzying rate of change, technological, social, and otherwise, leaves us depleted. Our stores of physical Uh, emotional, psychological energy are dissipated because we are still trying to catch up with the rapid, what, pace of change. Um, No less a figure than uh, one of our dear saints in the church uh, explains to us that change comes whether we want it or not. Uh, And we uh, seek out places of safety, security, and stability. So where do we go for that? Uh, We go to church. And we get to church, and what do we find? Change! But maybe, just maybe, if we listen 
to the story of God's involvement with human beings over history, we might just hear, see, find a couple of things that might help us with this thing called change. Our story today comes from the book of Genesis. Genesis, as you know, is easy to find. Somebody say amen. amen. This is book number one. Can't miss it. Open the book. There it is. And, and, and to this point, uh, we have heard the tremendous stories of creation, how God wanted to be in relationship with someone, and so he reached down, scooped up some mud, <laughs> blew into it. They received the stuff of life, and so there it was. And it traces the evolution of that relationship until we get to chapter 12, when we begin the series on the patriarchs. Who are the patriarchs? The patriarchs are those covenantal figures that God established relationship with to pass blessing through from generation to generation. So to this point, we have had stories about Abraham, the first patriarch, his son Isaac, who almost didn't make the cut. And now we come to the story about Isaac's kids, uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, particularly Jacob. Uh, Jacob, as you know, uh, was from his inception, from his birth, from his very beginnings, a conniver, a schemer, a trickster, a wrestler. Uh, he, 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 he won too good. And so it tells the story about how he tricked his brother out of his birthright because his brother was the firstborn. It tells the story about how he tricked his father into giving him the blessing that was supposed to go to his brother. Amen. Uh, it tells the story about how Esau got so mad that he said, if I see him, I'm going to kill him. I know nobody has ever had any sibling <laughs> things like that. Uh, that's why office hours are from 9 to 4. Amen. Uh, and, and, and then... Uh, he goes to a far country, he marries two women, <coughs> and manages to swindle his father-in-law out of a whole bunch of stuff. And then he gathers all his stuff and, and, and tries to get out of town in the, in, under the cover of night. Uh, and, and his father-in-law, who is no jewel, mind you, uh, caught up with him and they sort of got a truce. And now he's heading back home. And just as he gets to the outskirts of town, he remembers how badly he had treated his brother, how angry his brother was, and he begins to get fearful. And so he sends some messengers and said, uh, Esau, uh, I'm moving back into the neighborhood. I done bought a condo on 14th Street, amen. And, 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 and the messengers come back and say, uh, Esau knows you're coming, and he, he's coming with 400 men. <laughs> and so... Jacob is fearful. A change is coming, and he's what? Fearful. And so he gets his scheming, conniving self together and says, how can I fix this? So he sends ahead gifts. Uh, and, and, and biblical scholars say that uh, he received a, a whole bunch of gifts, like every hour on the hour. And Jacob sat back, and this is what the scripture says. I didn't say it. Scripture said it, that, that, that maybe he will receive these gifts, and maybe he'll be appeased, and maybe I'll see his face, and everything will be all square up. And so he sends everybody ahead of him, and uh, when we encounter him in this story, he's alone. And a professor of business consulting at the University of Massachusetts in a piece called The Seven Dynamics of Change he, he lists these three things for us that we might consider in the text. Number one, people will feel ill at ease with change. D duh. <laughs> Second, people will feel alone, like they're the only one who's going through change. Number three, people will focus initially on what they have to give up. Okay, so let's jump into the story. So it was that there he was alone by his own self. And sometimes I think you need to be alone with the Lord. And, and it's while he's alone that he does what every person who is fearful or out of sorts does or should do. He prays. And in the midst of that prayer, read the text. It's a great text. In the midst of that prayer, he says, Lord, I know I am not deserving, but I remember what you told me. 
what, when did he tell them? Well, you flip back to chapter 28. And you remember that he laid his head on a pillow, and all of a sudden in his dream he saw angels coming and going. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We, and so it was that he said, the Lord was here, and I didn't even know it. But when the Lord shows up, he said this to Jacob. He said, listen, the land where you're laying your head, I'm going to give to you and your peoples in, in perpetuity forevermore. They will be numerous as the sand on the shore and the stars in the sky, and I will be with you wherever you go until I do what I said I was going to do. And so in his prayer now, as he's in his anxiety about change and fearful about things, he remembers the promises of God. And sometimes when we get in the middle of prayer, sometimes we need to stop and think and remember God's promises. What has God promised to us? That we would have life and life abundantly, that we would have everything we need, what, not what we want, but everything we need, that he would give us health, that he would give us peace. If we would just sit down, slow down, take a deep breath, and receive it. And, 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 and so he claims in that prayer the promises of God. But you know what else he did? He said to God, look, I know I don't deserve nothing. Which is a prayer of what? Confession. And sometimes we need to confess if God's going to do anything with us. So he's sitting there, and he does what? People who are alone, who are anxious, who are in the midst of change, a tossing sea, he sits down, he creates some space, and he engages the discipline of prayer. Secondly, the text says, as he was sitting there by his own self, a man came and wrestled with him until the break of day. A man came. Now, you know... And I know, and the text makes clear, that the man was God. Which is to say, when we open ourselves to the possibility, God will come and be with us. But here's the puzzling thing for many. He, he wrestled with him. Now, this is where somebody might say, really? I mean, if I wrestle with God, I lose. Anybody with me here? Uh, but uh, a, a scholar in the New Interpreter's Bible puts it this way. That God's intention is to be with us. And not in a way that will overwhelm us. He desires to be genuinely, authentically, transparently with us. And in the Old Testament scriptures, he usually comes as a man or as an angel. But, but, but somebody ought to be with me here when I say in the New Testament, God comes to be with us. I don't think they, they get this. In the person of Jesus Christ, which is to say, if you feel alone in the midst of this vortex of change, know that you are never, ever, what? Alone, because God is always, what? with you, promise to be with you, never forsake you, be with you until the end of the age. And even at the end of the age, guess what? Still going to be with you. And so it is that he is with them, and, and, and they wrestle, and they tussle, and, and, and he asks him his name. And, and, and here's the point where he's got to give up something. Everybody knows sometimes you got to give up something. And he said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. In other words, my name is trickster, it's swindler, it's schemer, it's, it's all of these things that are not what God wants me to be. And the man, the angel, God, says, that ain't your name no more. You got to give what? All that up. And sometimes I think that we fail to be able to move forward because we grasp onto some things so tightly that when God has to move it, God has to pry it from our fingers. And how many of you know that hurts? Anybody with me? And you got to let loose. Sometimes you got to let go. And then the text says, the man took his finger and touched him on the hip and put his hip 
out of joint. What in the world? And he would walk with a limp the rest of his days. Sometimes we have to get broke before we can heal. Sometimes we have to be dislocated so we can be relocated. Sometimes we're here and God wants us to be there. And, and let me suggest this. If you ain't never been broke or dislocated, then God is probably not done with his work with you. Can I get away? Because we are creatures of habit. We are creatures, it, the hardest thing in the world to change is what? Human behavior. And, and God desires nothing more than we change some of our behavior. Uh, God does no longer wants us to be schemers or swindlers or, or, or tricksters or all the rest of that. Some of these things are basic to our human nature. I'm going to get mine, and if I ain't got enough, I'm going to get yours too. Somebody say amen. All right, it's just me. It's just me. And, and, and so it is that he, re, he dislocates him. He renames him because he's entered into prayer and he now has experienced the presence of God. And, and, but he's still scared. How many of you know sometimes we can know the Lord and still be scared? Because he says, I sent all these gifts ahead, but I still don't know what Esau is going to do. And so he moves ahead with trepidation. But he sees over the horizon, here come Esau with his 400 men. And most of us would say, it's over. I'm dead. But Esau runs to meet him, embraces him, kisses him, welcomes him. And the text says that Jacob says to Esau, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. Which is to say, sometimes if we can let go of our misgivings, sometimes if we can let go of all the rest of that and run towards the thing that we are anxious or fearful about, sometimes we get a blessing. Sometimes we find the thing that we always find when we run towards God. We find grace, the purely undeserved, unmerited love of God that wraps us up and lets us know that we are safe with him. So change does come, but sometimes change brings the blessing we all need. And the people of God all said amen. And so it is that we come now to a time when all of us can contribute, when we are joyful, when we are happy, because we take a moment to think about how good God has